So, hello. Uh, I'm Eden Yardeni. I'm a senior security engineer at Samsara. Specifically, I'm on our product security team and focusing on our application security functions. Uh, right now, what that means in practice, a lot of defining and refining our SDLC. Uh, we had an informal one before, and now we're becoming a lot more rigorous about it and rolling out all the practices therein. Uh, one of those practices, by the way, is uh, threat modeling. Um, threat modeling, I've been doing that for seven years or so, so you're in good hands today. Uh, I guess you could call me an enthusiast. I've tried out uh, all the big threat modeling frameworks, some of the small ones, and I'll, I'll give all those a mention here today. Uh, quick question. I think I assume all of us here are at least superficially familiar with threat modeling. Quick show of hands. Who here is done, like totally done rolling out threat modeling in their organization? Cool. We've got a, we've got an impressive show of hands. And by impressive, I mean like a fifth of the room. That's, that's more than I expected. It's, it's hard. It's difficult to get everybody on the same page doing the same work. And for me, it's a communication problem, honestly. Making sure that everyone has the same expectations of like what I'm looking for and what the exercise is meant to do. So I've spent a lot of time over the years really trying to refine this definition. There's a lot of ways you can explain to somebody like what threat modeling is and what they actually have to do. I've settled on a sentence fragment here, which is a group brainstorming activity to proactively find risks. Um, I had to whittle down a lot of words from this definition. Originally, it was much longer. Uh, anyone who knows me knows I like big words, so uh, this it took some effort to get down to this definition. But I, I went with something concise here because this is in response to people who may feel overwhelmed or frustrated about the prospect of having to do the additional work at all, right? So I want something bite-sized, friendly, approachable that they can sort of digest easily. Uh, what is threat modeling not? So I've had some mistaken impressions from people that I've had to uh, correct over the years. Let me start with the fun first one. Uh, threat modeling is security teams uh, signing off on risk, saying that, yep, this is fine, go ahead. Uh, that, that can be part of threat modeling, that can be a follow-on activity, but it's really not the heart of it, right? It's a collaborative exercise where we start off with some documentation, with some diagrams, and build a shared understanding of what the system is that we're collectively signing off on as a group. So yes, we're here to, to assess risks and then at the end say, oh, okay, I suppose, oh, yeah, I guess we can live with that, um, but, but that's not where we start, right? We want to... We want to start off with our data flow diagrams. We want to work through those and elicit some threats. So this is absolutely not just a sign-off activity. It's also, <laughs> these are some other words I've, I've encountered, uh, being like, hey, can you approve our, uh, our design? Can, can you bless the design? Um, I've, I've had to look into why this is such a thing. Um, Oftentimes, folks would like to say that they have the security team's blessing or approval. It, it sounds nice, but it's also, from my perspective, delightfully vague, right? What exactly did I sign off on? Um, one reason I'm, I push threat modeling so hard is I'll tell folks, like, I, I, again, I don't feel comfortable, like, looking at a system and saying, okay, this, I, I'm gonna not lose any sleep at night without that more thorough exercise. Um, so there's a lot of ways to do threat modeling, though. There's a few competing uh, frameworks and methodologies out there. Uh, and today I'd like to share, I have scientifically determined that there is exactly one superior methodology, and it is, no, I'm just kidding. They're, they're all great. They're all wonderfully useful. Uh, they all have their own niche use cases. And uh, actually, in this presentation, uh, I'm going to talk about three of them. Uh, hopefully some of which you've heard about. If you've not, um, there's plenty of people here who would love to talk your ear off about Stride, Pasta, Linden, and all the rest. I'm one of them. Uh, right. Uh, but to do that, let me present a sample scenario to you guys. Let's say that we are working with a hypothetical uh, e-commerce company. Actually, no, I think I called it a uh, 
fintech company, Global Shop. Uh, we're worldwide, so you don't have to be. What a delightfully uh, snarky and sardonic uh, slogan, but uh, we're not marketing people, so we're just going to leave that be and continue with the scenario. So again, Global Shop is a fintech startup. Some of their APIs that we'll be looking at today integrate with banking functions and include banking transactions. So immediately, that is, uh, hopefully that raises some concerns or, or at least per ears are starting to perk up that this is something we want to assess with, uh, with some rigor. And specifically, as a PM, the feature we're going to be looking at today involves executing bank transactions. So, you know, no sweat. And finally, you as a PM, you know, you're, you're new to the company and you want to make a good impression and you want to make sure that your feature rollout goes out smoothly and it doesn't contain any fatal flaws that will sink it later. So you're trying to do your due diligence and you reach out to your security team uh, for some guidance. Oh, how did that get there? Hmm. I'll have to talk to the marketing department about that. Cool. Uh, anyway, let's talk a little bit about how I define threat modeling, how I present it to people, how I structure it. Uh, this is not a new framework. I promise I'm not here to be like, hey, I invented a new framework. Uh, no, it's more a set of activities that I'm like, this is what you have to do. Um, I was at OWASP SAM user day yesterday. Any SAM people or SAM enthusiasts? Great uh, OWASP project. Highly recommend it if you're in the... Uh, AppSec space and you're thinking about maturing your practices. Anyway, uh, there's a presenter there yesterday who talked about uh, threat modeling as one of the constituent considerations of OWASP SAM. So he asked a question like, what is the most common question you get as an AppSec professional about threat modeling? Um, the, the second most popular question we, we hear as AppSec professionals is, is like, how does threat modeling work? But more often than not, people want to start off with like, what even is it? What is this thing you're telling me you have to do? And in practice, that means like, what do you want from me? Like, what as a security team do you want from a PM so that they, they can go through this uh, activity and then get the blessing or whatever and, and get the security team off their back? Uh, that's more often than not the subconscious narrative uh, with PMs some of the time. Um, not necessarily all the time. Sometimes you've got your PMs who are very enthusiastic about security, but uh, can't take that for granted. Anyway, uh, I start off with scoping. I mentioned some of the ma major uh, threat modeling methodologies out there. Another one I want to shout out is uh, Adam Shostak's four questions. Uh, some of these might be reminiscent of this here. So scoping, for example, ask people to say, what are we building? What exactly is in scope here? I highly recommend folks to focus on features and components as the scope of their threat model. Not necessarily a product, although that depends on how an organization is structured and how they break down work. Um, but features and components, I find, are a good starting point to say, well, what exactly are we working on and why are we here today? Uh, then document following on the uh, four question framework. Uh, this is the what can go wrong piece. So I'll, I, have, I have a few questions for folks. I'm like, first of all, are you worried about anything? Are there any specific business cases that you're concerned about from uh, um, any specific bad actors? We have them in the e-commerce space, the fintech space, as we'll see here later. Um, I also give a table. I think I, I was uh, heavily inspired from the... Uh, from, from Adam Shostak's book on, uh, on threat modeling. There's a, there's a table in there on threat actors and their motivations. That works really well to motivate people and get their brain juices flowing about what can go wrong. So I'm always like, if you don't have any concerns, that's, that's fine. Uh, here's some ideas to help get your, uh, again, creative juices flowing. But uh, otherwise, we'll continue evaluating the system as it is, even if we don't have any of those specific attacker personas that we're concerned about. 
Uh, next is decompose. I borrowed this from the pasta framework. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that one. I don't use it a lot day to day myself just because pasta in, in my experience does, um, I think put a bigger emphasis on attacker personas, which is good and it's important, but sometimes teams just aren't there. Um, so in general, I ask teams to decompose their application because teams know their application. They know how they built it. They know all the constituent components that went into that application. They know like where they're logging data to or all the databases are. Like I need to know these things also so that we can come into a threat modeling discussion and have a well, meaningful conversation and elicit some issues. Oh, skipped ahead. Uh, then I ask folks to build that data flow diagram. A lot of that is walking people through what exactly that entails, holding their hand. Lots of folks have maybe used UML before, maybe built like sequence diagrams, not necessarily data flow diagrams, but walk them through that all the same. And this is this is the set of work, these four activities. There's, there's a couple more after this, but these are the four things I ask people to do as pre-work, right? I want, when we come into a discussion, all of this information on the table so that we can hit the ground running. I don't have to ask like, hey, where, where are you uh, saving files? Where are you persisting files to? Like that should all just be on the table as we meet because that just saves everybody's time, right? The developers don't have to sit there and explain to me like, well, this is what's going on. We're all just operating from a shared understanding and we can start finding some threats. Uh, I call that enumerate here. Um, I think a lot of sources call this like eliciting threats, threat elicitation. Uh, I like that word. I kind of prefer that word to enumerate, but again, I, uh, I have a habit of, of big words trying to cut down on those. I guess enumerate is also a big word, but whatever. Uh, anyway, so it's the idea of once we have a da uh, data flow diagram, going through that for each one, asking like what can go wrong, what can we do about this. So that's the enumerate stage using your uh, framework of choice, whatever that might be. And then finally, assigning. So this is the actioning step. So this is taking the risks that come out of a threat modeling discussion. I always tell people risks are my artifacts. So I'll have a list of risks. They might be in Jira tickets or they might be in some some form where each risk is a discrete thing that you can assign to somebody and you can assign a state, right? You can be like, we need to look into this or uh, actually, we've resolved this or obviated the concern by changing the design in some way. Or we accept it. And then if we accept a risk, that, of course, needs to bubble up. And then maybe we re revisit continually. Which risks have we accepted over time? So this is how I like to lay it out for newcomers to threat modeling in any organization I'm in. Uh, because this focuses on, like, what, what do I need from you? Like, what is this going to be? What's the time commitment? Because that's really where people tend to be. Uh, I've included some text here, but, you know, that just rehashes what I just said. Again, I, I told you before, I promise I'm not here to introduce a new framework. Uh, this, this doesn't really make for a great framework if you try to make this into, a uh, uh, initialism or acronym, it's like S-D-D-D-E-A. I, I, I tried to change it, I really did, to make it more like memorable, but you know, that's that's not what we're doing here. It's not, it's not the next stride, it's just me breaking it down for folks in an organization. Let me zoom in, as they say, on the decomposition piece. So that's this activity from earlier, the third one where I ask folks to describe what exactly, like tell me about all your components, data stores and such. Uh, and let me massively oversimplify what that entails. So first of all, it's modeling your architecture, like building a data flow diagram. That's the drawing the data flows piece. So that's just describing like, how is your thing built, right? I wanna know that. Uh, and also uh, called out in the pasta book is describe your users, right? Like who's actually going to be using this thing? Uh, what roles should they be assigned to? What should they uh, what should they be able to do? Um, this is some more specifics from uh, from the pasta book. So starting out with like again personas. That's kind of a UI UX term, but like who are all your different kinds of people who are going to be using your application and what's their backstory? What do they, uh, what do they actually need to accomplish? Um, service accounts. So that's like if you have any, um, backend services or APIs or whatever in your, uh, in your system, like what 
identity is that going to be running under? Uh, for any identity in your system in general, I want you to tell me how are they going to be authenticating, um, whether that's interactively or not. Please tell me. Uh, and then finally, privileged functions. So this is, let's say you have a feature. Can you narrow that down for me to which actions are extra privileged and extra sensitive and which ones not so much? Because that makes a difference, right? That um, some roles within the same feature should be able to execute more actions than others. That's just how, like if you're an administrator, or even like a local organization administrator, you inherently have more privileges based on your role to execute more actions than somebody else in the same feature. So that's relevant in a threat modeling context because we'll be looking at data flows from one component to another. And I want to know, like, who's actually going to be submitting the request? Because that might change how we process it, how we respond. And I want to walk through some examples of that. So let's do some threat modeling together. Uh, I put up a very simple but uh, basic data flow diagram up here, outlining what our uh, transaction execute operation might look like at Global Shop. Global Shop, you'll recall, is the uh, fintech startup from earlier. So I've got a uh, I've got a stick figure on the left user. Uh, they're outside the trust boundary, so that's that's helpful. The user doesn't live in AWS where this uh, or this is architected. So that first data flow is going from again outside the trust boundary, like the user's browser, to an AWS API gateway. Again. Hypothetically, let's say this is how it's built. Uh, so the transaction execute route might be hosted on API Gateway, and then that goes off to a Lambda to verify, like, hey, this transaction we're trying to execute, uh, are there enough funds uh, all around from the source account to the target account? I might check an account database after that, and then log that whole operation to uh, AWS CloudWatch, it will then go into a step function. For those who don't know, that's basically like a workflow. Um, update the balance and then send out an email notification being like, hey, we executed a transaction. Uh, so pretty simple operation here. Uh, again, for more context, uh, though you don't have to do this in threat modeling, I included like a sample payload here. Uh, so this is just describing like, we want to send money from an account to an account associated with maybe like a branch ID, this is how much money, and maybe here's some additional context about who's sending the, uh, who's sending the money where and, uh, and why. Uh, so already, just like I can spot some threats. Uh, I'm curious if you guys can, but right off the bat, let me just talk about some of those. Uh, for starters, there's some major potential for uh, insecure direct object reference here. There's a few values in here that we should just be pulling from the uh, the session. So, for example, uh, email to notify. Uh, no reason you shouldn't get that from session context, right? If uh, if some jabroni is an email account or associated with a session, just send the email notification to that session. Don't let somebody um, specify in the request where uh, where notification is going. Uh, a few other things. There's no uh, CSERF token in this request. There's no, um, there's no like secure cookie flags. So these are th considerations that might come up again if you're looking at Stride. That might, those might be tampering concerns uh, or spoofing with a branch ID or uh, or email to notify. Uh, not to say that you can't find any elevation of privilege concerns with this uh, with diagram. You. Uh, I think you certainly can, but uh, honestly, I think we can enrich the information provided here and get a lot more specific about like who's executing this operation and find some more interesting stuff. Uh, so just to recap, uh, recap from a uh, from an access control standpoint, what do we know so far? So we know the persona is like user. That's the stick figure from the beginning. Maybe they uh, authenticate or. The, um, all these services authenticate with an IAM role. Um, as for the user, maybe they um, authenticate to, the, to our platform with SSO. And when I ask, like, what are the privileged functionalities? Somebody's like, transaction execute. Well, okay, but that doesn't really 
get us that much closer to some interesting insights about like based on the different kinds of users, what can go wrong here? So can we do better? I think so. I think there's potential to uh, to refine this a bit and ask a few more targeted questions at who's actually doing this. Uh, so I'm going to talk about access maps. That's the uh, that's the titular paved road in the paved road to express RBAC. Uh, so access map is like a mechanism that I came up with. Eh, mechanism might not be the right word, but a, a framework to be like, what additional context can I ask for? before we head into a threat modeling discussion about who's doing this. Uh, so I start off by listing these, what I call, core properties. Um, you might be able to tell there's uh, actually a table with three more or two more columns, um, light foreshadowing there. But again, I call these core properties because I expect there to be information about these things for any endpoint you're trying to execute. So for example, any endpoint might have a principle associated with it, like who is going to be interacting with it, uh, and then entity type, like what's it returning? Um, situational properties, these are things that might sometimes be relevant, but I still want to ask about. So for example, data classification, like what kind of data is it returning? Like have you validated that it's like PII or not PII? Um, these are things we should probably bring into the discussion. Um, and finally, what I, I'm calling dynamics. So these are things that might be changing at runtime, which is really interesting. There, there are many, many times where based on things changing as you run the application or as a user does their thing, maybe you want to change your access control decisions. So I'll get into some specific examples of that. Uh, starting off with the core stuff. Uh, not a lot of surprises with these first few. So again, the, Endpoint is transaction execute. Uh, it should be executable by a user. Uh, that's the action name. And again, while this all seems rather perfunctory, it's still good to bring to a threat modeling discussion and to me. Uh, again, security teams, they have to learn about new features all the time. So the more specific you can get about what a route does and what exactly it's uh, meant to do and document that, uh, it's, it's great for me, it makes my life easier. But let's get to some more juicy stuff because, oh, this is interesting, right? So actually, we're not just dealing with user, right? There's multiple roles that we want to consider. And based on those roles, uh, we might want to change what we're, uh, what we're returning or who can access transaction execute or what kind of transactions they might be able to execute. So going back real quick, like, this is the same data flow diagram, but just based on who this user is, like the, the same exact data flows might have totally different considerations for the same exact operation. So I really want to know about like who all these roles are. Again, Pasta does talk about this and asks about this, um, but I, I try to ask about it again here. Uh, custom roles with access, so, oh, it turns out auditors can sometimes uh, run transaction execute, really want to know about that and why, and should they really be able to execute transactions and when? Uh, and again, this might seem obvious, entity type transaction, but uh, I can't tell you enough how many times I'll be in conversations with like product teams who are like, well, we're not really sure what data we're returning. And I'm like, well, we, it, it would be great, it would be ideal if we all just kind of knew that all the time, right? Like, what is this endpoint returning? What are we getting back? So as obvious as it seems through this example, like, yes, please, please, please specify the entity type is transaction here. Uh, and I include some, in, like, author, example authorization checks here. So again, this just gets us a little bit closer to finding, like, oh, maybe there's some things we didn't think about. Mm -mm -mm. Cool. Let me talk about some of these situational things. Uh, so these are, again, considerations that might sometimes be relevant, but I want to ask about. Uh, in this case, transaction super, super sensitive. Um, let's, let's bring that up. Let's make sure we're all on the same page, that transactions are sensitive. In this contrived example, that might be obvious to all of us, but 
you know, we, we look at a lot of data flows and a lot of uh, threat models day to day. So it helps to specify that right up front. Like, yes, this entity is sensitive and it's subject to these uh, regulations and considerations. So something to keep in mind from an elevation of privilege standpoint. Um, sometimes we might want to group together transactions and do different access control stuff based on um, whether they've got like the same deposit ID, withdrawal ID, what have you, uh, calling out related actions. So I'm like, well, uh, maybe when we look at a data flow diagram for validating a transaction or summarizing a transaction, like let's refer back to this one. So let's make sure all our data flow diagrams are linked together in some way. So calling out like that is something similar from an access control standpoint. Um, as as there are changes in like a label, you might want to be like, oh, maybe we want to restrict access to this transaction now. So uh, I think I actually cover approval status here, but transaction status. So let's say uh, your bank teller from earlier shouldn't be able to see uh, or edit transactions in progress, um, but a financial manager can. So some roles might be able to override or execute operations just based on the state of that entity that others might not. So another reason to talk about all the different roles ahead of time. Uh, and then finally, additional authorization checks for this one. Uh, if you're executing a very sensitive or high value transaction, maybe MFA again, right? Maybe have somebody um, break glass or authenticate or in some other way, reassert their identity. Um, maybe you do that for bank tellers and not for some roles. So again, really helps to think about all the different roles when, when considering these things. Uh, these are the, the fun ones, the, the dynamic stuff. So maybe you want to make sure like, hey, if somebody's executing a transaction like off bank hours, like what's, what's that about? Let's, let's not approve that. Because maybe there's a very rigorous approvals workflow and you want to make sure like a supervisor signs off on all transactions half an hour, like no later than half an hour after they post. Maybe that's a rule. Um, so you want to, you want to make sure that's called out here. Uh, maybe make sure they're in the region you expect, like if their IP address doesn't line up, maybe you flag that um, when, when an operation's executing. And I talked a little bit about transaction status, approval status is pretty similar. Uh, let me hop right to conclusions because I think we're almost at time. Uh, cool, so app decomposition, super important. I do it for all my threat modeling discussions. Uh, it comes from, uh, or Pasta calls it out as one of the steps. And I don't really care what framework you use or what you like to use, like decompose the application. Like make sure there's a whole listing of what goes into it. No matter what framework you use, it'll be super handy. So yeah, and then specifically, go into personas, like explore all the different personas and their roles and what are some, some of the considerations there. Uh, these functional considerations might not make it into a data flow diagram. Uh, part of the problem here is that product managers may not necessarily be in the room, right? There's been much ink spilled about getting everybody in the room in a threat modeling discussion. I couldn't agree more. So. That those are the folks who are going to bring up these functional considerations like, hey, based on these personas, like maybe we shouldn't be able to execute a transaction like from this location or uh, depending on which roles are assigned. And uh, yeah, these access map things, uh, that's just the name I came up for it. Um, it's short, simple, easy to communicate and I found it to be really effective when enumerating uh, elevation of privilege risks. Quick shout out, totally dropped the ball on Linden, but uh, super helpful for any of the Linden risks too. So, thanks. Thank you very much, Eden. Thank you for sharing with us amazing topics. Is there any question? We still have 10 minutes, I think, to get some question. And you have a mic just behind, just there. Thanks. I don't know if the mic works there. It is? Yeah, you, you just yeah. Yeah. Just 
Just, Helen, can you please repeat the question for the recording, please? Yeah, so just getting my impressions on AI-driven threat modeling and uh, what I make of that at a high level. Is that accurate? Yeah, um, actually, I, I dropped in a very brief, as I talk to people about this presentation, folks are like, are you going to talk about AI? Is that a consideration here? And I'm like, no, but I'll drop a quick mention of it in passing, just to, like as a snide remark here. Um, so I, I don't put a ton of stock into it. I think it can be really helpful. I use a lot of AI tools all the time, uh, but only as like consultative and assisting tools. I'm a little skeptical about driving everything immediately off of threat modeling. So I think it's a fantastic tool to like, hey, look at my threat model. Did I do a good job? One of the other <laughs> four questions there. So getting some, uh, it's, it's great for feedback. I don't know if it's there yet, like as an automated threat modeling tool. Maybe there's, maybe there's some vendors out there who will uh, inform me of, of developments in that area. There's certainly uh, a couple in this room who are in that space, not necessarily in threat modeling, but in some other things. So I'm not discounting AI entirely, but um, uh, let's, let's stick with manual for now and AI for validation. Other question? Hello, hello. All right. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I have a question regarding your uh, threat modeling, let's call it workshop or whatever you, you call it. How does it look like? And where do you bring in these details, especially not to, to make sure that you don't overburden them with too much details? So you, yeah. I know it's a it's a question that could go for a couple of hours answering, yes. <laughs> so a high-level overview is fine. Thanks. Yeah, I think I'm still figuring that out, right? Um, because uh, everybody's different, and, and every organization is different, and overburdening for some people might be like perfect for others. So I think there's a balance like between what an organization and business unit's tolerance is for process and documentation. I try to be flexible. So in organizations I work with, uh, I've got some documentation. The, um, some of the steps I alluded to earlier with like scoping, documenting, decompose diagram, I consider that homework for teams. But the way I, I frame that or I spin that is like, if you do the homework, like we spend less time in meetings where everyone's just like sitting there rehashing how the application works, right? Like this is stuff we can do asynchronously. And you know, you're a hero because you don't waste everybody's time in meetings. So yeah, it can be documentation heavy. I think there's a balance. So in general, what I would do is like meet with somebody individually just to talk them through this, uh, give them some documentation to look at, give them a checklist being like, Hey, here's everything I need from you. And then we like bring more people in the room and let's, let's do this. <clears throat> My question is specifically about the access maps. Do you see them as homework for security engineer? Do the leg work with PMs, fill them, bring them as one of the input to the session? Or do you do it collaboratively in the actual threat modeling? Yeah, actually, I see that as more PM oriented. Now, again, I, this is in flux, and I want to make it more PM friendly than it is today, because there's a lot here. So I'm actually actively thinking about, like, how can I surface these questions? in a way that's maybe, you know, more friendly, more approachable. Uh, some of the considerations are definitely developer related. So like, uh, what's the endpoint or like the action name as a slug? Um, those might be better answered by developers, but also like there's considerations. Let me go back to the access maps. Uh, talking about principles and entity types, like that stuff has to come from PMs, period. Um, so PMs need to like answer and we all need to be on the same page about what are we returning? Like, so, and that, that's a functional requirement, right? So some of this stuff I see as like PMs answering with developers in the room. And then refining the presentation over time to make this friendlier for product folks. What else? You still have time for uh, one more question, if you want. So yeah. I don't need to buy it. 
for the for the properties you ask, are people able to action them when they discover something that's uh, you know maybe they haven't taken into account? Because I could feel like you could ask any number of properties, but if people can't do anything about them, is it is yep. it sort of worth asking? And how do you sort of decide how much you're planning for the future in terms of asking these things versus uh, trying to get them to implement things sort of right now that could help improve security? Yeah, so two ways to answer that. First of all, these are this is not prescriptive. This is just a list of properties that have worked for me and that I want to share with you as an observation of like, hey, I've asked about this stuff. It's been super helpful. Maybe over time I'll add more properties or maybe some of these aren't relevant depending on an organization and some other ones are. So definitely see myself adding to this over time. It just depends on, again, what exactly you're trying to look for in your, in your threat model. As for the second part of your question, sorry, can you restate that? Uh, I think it was just saying, um, do you consider what the teams can actually action? So if you call a property for, say, time of day that people mm -hmm. should be using it, but they've got no ability to you know, limit that in any sense, how do you sort of factor what they can and can't do into what you ask? Yeah, again, some of this stuff might not be relevant for a system, right? So if that's, if, if factoring in time of day doesn't really matter, then doesn't need to be included. This is just a list of considerations that may or may not be relevant depending on what you're building. And I kind of prefer it that way because I've said this twice before, and I'll say it a third time. I'm not trying to invent a new, like, stride here. So this is just like, a mechanism that I've used to like ask additional questions and get more information about what roles are supposed to be able to do. One more question. Still have three minutes. If not, thanks very much again yeah. for your time. <laughs> <laughs>